Hello, hello students and welcome to week two of communication law, ethics and diversity. In this week's session, you would have noticed that I gave you a break given that today is MLK day and I'd like to honor the holiday by making sure that you get your much deserved rest after the first week of the semester. So this week we'll be talking about how the law is made and judicial review. And if I do have time to go to the first amendment module, I will be taking you through that particular lecture as well. But let's talk about how the law is made and judicial review. Have you ever thought about exactly who sits down to scribe or to draft legislation? And what are we held by or held accountable to as citizens of the United States? I'm going to start by sharing my slides so that you can follow along with me in the context of how the law is actually made. Now, there are a couple of perimeters that I'd like for you to take note of in this particular segment of the lecture. And this has to do with the fact that legal rules bind both the government and us as citizens, of course, non-citizens as well, who come to the United States as maybe um, legal workers who are maybe here on non-immigrant visas, persons who are visitors, they're all bound by the same rules that we are bound by, and of course, by defining the boundaries of acceptable behavior, the laws that we are aware of, they help to establish the power and range of punishment that is meted out to us um, when we break the laws. And of course, it also dictates the procedures for creating and applying as well as interpreting and changing the law that we see applied to our daily lives. Now, there are a couple of perimeters to all of what I've just explained in terms of the boundaries, uh, what we are known to um, subscribe to, those behaviors that are deemed as acceptable or unacceptable in the court of law, and of course, the punishments that are extended toward anyone who actually breaks the law. And these perimeters are really framed as well-crafted laws that are clear and tailored to address you know, to address identified harms or advance particular government or societal interests. So you may find that there are laws that identify harms to the person um, in the context of the laws that have to do with someone's privacy. If there is harm to somebody's, um, you know, mental well-being or physical well-being, those are also defined within the law. There is a limit or an extent to which you can actually pry or breach someone's privacy, um, whether or not that person is a public or a private figure, and you may you will more than likely be made liable for damages as a result of harm brought against that particular individual. Um, the well-crafted laws are clear and tailored as well in the sense that it advances particular government or societal interests. And so again, if I go back to laws that have to do with privacy and those that are really advancing the interests of national security, there are perimeters within which, um, you know, journalists are held, um, whether or not they will apply the First Amendment principles, a lot has to do with how they are exercising those particular rights and the extent to which they can actually exercise those rights within the confines of what is defined as national or state interests. Then perimeters are also built-in procedures, and this is what discourages the rapid and revolutionary change in the law while permitting legal flexibility, as we see, in response to evolving needs and concerns. And legal flexibility really has to do with if there is a need for change in the context of the situation, if there's a need for what we call sunset legislation, if there is a game or a match, and there is need to reinforce or to enforce legislation around that particular activity, this is when legal flexibility takes place. At the end of that activity, there ceases to be that particular um, reinforcement around that activity. All right, so needs and concerns will change and evolve. And so legal flexibility is applied when those particular needs or concerns emerge. Now in the US court system, there are several layers or levels within the court system. And so the first one is the federal court system. And for the federal court system, there is one system for each state across the United States. There is also the courts of the District of Columbia and the territories. And we know that one of the territories is actually Puerto Rico. 
um, Puerto Rico, sometimes we hear about Puerto Rico as if it's not a US territory, but it is still a US territory. And then we also have the third court system, which is the military court system. Some may say military. Um, the military court system really is where those particular breaches in the context of national security that are committed you know, by a military officer, they're court martialed. And so they do not, they do not necessarily pass through the regular court system because that's a different system altogether assigned to actually try and to um, convict anyone within the military system. Then we have three levels. I'd like to explain now there are three levels within the United States court system. And the first level has to do with what happens at the level of the trial court. Um, then the next level would be the appellate or the intermediate court. And of course, at the very highest level would be the Supreme Court system. Now, trial courts and intermediate courts or appellate courts are responsible for hearing and reviewing legal cases that have already been decided at a trial level or at other lower courts. And of course, at the Supreme Court level, because the Supreme Court is where people go when their courts, their, their cases are either thrown out or they're not satisfied with the ruling or the verdict, they take their court cases to the Supreme Court, all right? Now, what the trial courts actually do at the very first level is to review the evidence of a case or the facts that are brought to bear by both the plaintiff and the defendant to determine the proper outcome of that particular case. And so both levels of the appellate courts review the legal basis for the decisions of the lower court system, and then they make their determination. Now state and federal courts, they function largely independent of each other. So there's no intersection in terms of what happens at the state level and what happens at the court system because there's no control within those particular systems. But the federal constitution that we are really agents, um, we, we, we're actually a part of, that we're supposed to be, um, you know, um, not defending, but the federal constitution that we're supposed to be bound by as citizens, it establishes the Supreme Court of the United States of America, and it's called SCOTUS. You would have heard about POTUS, which is President of the United States of America. SCOTUS is the acronym for the Supreme Court of the United States. And what the Supreme Court of the United States does, it provides for other federal courts to oversee questions related to international, interstate, and federal law. So what the Supreme Court will do if there is something happening at the level of the federal government, you can leave the state of Georgia and take your case to the Supreme Court for it to be tried at a very high level, to be heard at a very high level because you might not have gotten the satisfaction, a company, an organization or an individual may not have gotten the satisfaction at the level of the federal court. And so they're actually going there to see exactly what is happening and what might be the sanctions or what might be the decision-making um, that may overrule what happened at the federal level, all right? So questions related to international issues, international law, um, what takes place in terms of the U.S.'s um, international, perhaps, intervention. These are things that are happening at the level of the Supreme Court as well. If something happens across state lines, it, uh, it's, it's invariably taken to the Supreme Court level and stuff like that. So this is what happens within the federal constitution of the United States. Now, you would know that the Supreme Court has the power. It is the Supreme Court that has the power to review the constitutionality of final rulings of the highest state courts. So if something happens at the federal level in the state of Georgia, for instance, the Supreme Court can review that particular constitutionality. They can review what would have happened at the level of the state to find out whether the judgment was based on what was in the United States Constitution, whether there is a breach or there is a, an attempt to subvert justice as a result of what is written in the Constitution of the United States. So they're there as sort of a, a, a vanguard of the constitution, so to speak. So if I were to describe the functionality of the US Supreme Court, it is to watch as, 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 as overseers of what is happening at the federal level to make sure that no ruling supersedes or contravenes the constitution of the United States, all right? So state courts are established really by relevant state constitutions 
and they have jurisdiction over issues arising within the state and of course relating to the state laws at that particular state level. Now, in the United States court system, a lot of new technologies have emerged over the years. And of course, this is bringing some degree of challenge to court jurisdiction because in the internet era that we're living in, you have traditional jurisdictional boundaries now, not necessarily within the confines of a state, but you have those boundaries extended beyond the state level. So you will find that in some cases, people who have access to the internet, who have access to Twitter, um, former President Trump, he would have been stating and saying things, other people would have been stating and saying things that have to do with the elections. Let's talk about elections of 2020 and what happened and you know, pronouncements on what the state should be doing or what should happen at the jurisdictional level um, in the court system. And so people have come to um, participate in a number of ways using the technologies and of course overreaching in some instances to speak to court jurisdiction because the internet is no longer um, you know, holding us at bay in terms of operating at the court level, at the state level, so to speak. But you can actually have discussions across the internet that is really transcending um, the state level jurisdiction. So this is the ubiquity, well, it's, 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 maybe the pronunciation is wrong, but we say that, you know, the internet has really expanded the awareness levels, participation, and the presence and access to information. And so the ubiquitous nature of information has really impacted what is happening at the jurisdictional level or boundaries within the US court system. So that's the reason why in some cases you will find that some of the um, readings or the case studies that you will see, those court rulings in terms of who can actually be sanctioned and whether you know, the internet service provider should be held liable this is where the court comes in, in terms of jurisdictional boundaries in the context of who can control content and who can actually speak and what should actually happen in the context of people's particular um, you know, assertions about the court system or, or, or about even within the context of the, the First Amendment. Um, uh, and I'm speaking specifically about speech. Now, trial courts in the US court systems Trial courts are the entry level or the first level for most legal disputes that you will find happening in the US. They're basically fact-finding forums and are the only courts to use juries. So if you've ever been called to jury duty, you will see that these are really cases that are at the very entry level for legal disputes, whether it's something that has to do with um, uh, some sort of you know, theft, um, larceny, something that has to do with somebody who has um, been charged for a manslaughter, which is a lesser count of um, a murder charge, something that has to do with, um, you know, an issue pertaining to, you know, grand theft auto, um, you know, a hit and run, you know, so, so, so those types of cases are the entry level for a lot of legal disputes, even for something that has to do with forgery. Um, in some cases, depending on the gravity of the situation, you will find that that particular issue will go to the trial court at the very first instance. Now, that particular trial will move to the next level, which is the appellate court or the court of appeal. And of course, appellate courts, they include the 13 federal circuit courts of appeal, or you know, in the case of Georgia, the 11th circuit court has jurisdiction over Georgia. And generally what these courts do, they defer to the trial court on matters related to facts um, in terms of reviewing the legal process of the lower court. So what the appellate courts will actually do is to review what happened at the lower court to see exactly how did the judgment emerge? What were the facts in the situation that led to the case either being thrown out or a judgment in favor of the plaintiff or the defendant? To what extent did they follow the constitution in issuing the final judgment? Was it a fair trial or was it a mistrial? Where was there a preponderance of evidence for the judgment to have emerged, or was there a situation where there was some, um, you know, content that was not necessarily brought to the attention of, of, of the jury 
was there any form of um, trial in the court of opinion in the context of the public's opinion influencing the jury decision or was there some sort of misfavor in the context of the judgment coming from the, um, the, 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 the presiding judge. So this is what the appellate court will do. They will not try to, at the first instance, re, um, you know, sort of, of, of reintroduce something new, but they will just generally check to see what happened at the trial court to the very first level to review the legal process before making a final determination. So moving right along, you will find that most federal court of appeals or most federal court of appeal rulings are handed down by a three judge panel. Um, you will have judges who are operating independent of each other. In some cases, they are in concurrence or agreement with each other, but invariably you'll find that they're a panel of three. And of course the courts will sometimes review important cases and bank that is all the judges in a circuit will rule on a case. All right, so they'll be called upon to give their judgment in a particular instance or a case that arises before them. And so a majority of the opinions that will come from a court of appeal will establish what we call binding precedent within the court's jurisdiction. I should let you know that a lot of what has arisen and a lot of what is practiced in law, whether we're talking about in the strict sense of the law I know this is communication, law, ethics, and diversity. A lot of what you will see emerging in the context of the law, it's basically binding precedent, and that is what actually is used as the benchmark or the foundation for, for future judgments. So you're, you're never going to find an instance where a judgment is made that is independent of something that has been previously judged or derived as a result of what the judges have found in that particular case. So when you hear the term precedence, you will know that there was a previous ruling that would have set the precedent for the ruling that is actually made, let's say today, tomorrow, next week, or within a year. So there must have been some sort of consistency with previous cases and the rulings that would have caused the binding precedence to be established within the court's jurisdiction. So a lot of what you will see coming out of a court of appeal, it would be based on previous cases and the precedents that they would have set to, to really formalize those judgments in those cases. Now, something to note, something very, very important to note is that appeal courts can affirm, they can reverse or they can remand the decision of the lower court. Remind, just to remind you, I did say that what the appeal courts will do initially is to review the judgments that would have occurred at the lower court. So if they are thinking based on their review that it's a very fair judgment that was handed down, judgment in favor of the defendant, they can affirm based on that particular review because it's a very thorough process. If they believe that the judgment really should have gone in favor of the plaintiff, they can review that particular case and reverse the judgment and of course, put the judgment in favor of the defendant. Or they can send the, court, the, the case back to the lower court, meaning they can remand the decision and they can say to the lower court, there are a couple of things that are not necessarily consistent here in this case. Evidence was not admitted that should have been admissible. Um, you did not hear X or Y as, as key witnesses in this particular case. You took into account all of the public opinions but you did not necessarily take into account witness opinions and testimony. And so you need to go back to the lower court. So this is what the appeals court can actually do, all right? In a tripartite setting, they can actually affirm or uphold, they can reverse the ruling, or they can say, you know what? You guys need to go back to the lower court with this case because there are a couple of inconsistencies or glitches that appear to have occurred at that particular level there in the state system. Now, in some cases, individual judges may join the opinion of the court. They may write separate concurrence, reaching the same decision, but for different reasons, or they may dissent from the court's opinion. I hope you are thinking through carefully as I, I lecture on the implications of what it is I'm talking about um, based on what would have been in the news in the not so um, distant past. Now, 
before we, we heard about the Roe v. Wade, you know, reversal, um, there were instances in the news when there was talk about concurrence and there was talk about dissent. There was talk about one particular judge who did not necessarily agree with the, 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 the casting down or the reversal of Roe v. Wade or striking down of Roe v. Wade and there were some other judges who were in concurrence. In this particular instance, you will find that individual judges may have joined in the opinion at the end of the day, they got the majority votes to actually strike the, le the legislation down, but there would have been separate concurrence reaching the same decision. But of course, for different reason, even though we might have heard about dissent coming from one particular judge, all right? In some cases, there might be separate concurrence or they might be dissent from the court's opinion in the particular case. But I'd just like you to think through judgments that would have been passed in, 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 the, in the past in the US court system coming from, let's say, the Supreme Court. And of course, there are variations to how they emerged or arrived at the judgment. And of course, different opinions and perspectives were expressed by different judges at the time. Now, the Supreme Court, and this brings me to the Supreme Court. It is the court of last resort in the United States. And in most instances, it, it has discretion to determine what cases to review. Again, Roe v. Wade was actually reviewed thoroughly. And this is where we come back to the situation of how can and why did the Supreme Court actually review that particular piece of legislation and of course, we know the end result, the actual legislation was struck down. But um, bear in mind, the court did not strike the legislation down to the detriment of every state because it's at the state level now that the justices will determine whether they will enforce legislation to prosecute or whether they will leave that to the discretion of, 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 of those persons who are actually going to seek the services and stuff like that, all right? Courts will not overreach at the state level, even though the Supreme Court, which is the court of last resort, has actually struck down the legislation. You will find that in some states, they are pretty much aligned with and um, to what has happened to the highest court of last resort. But in some cases, the states are allowing justices at the state level to determine punishment or infractions if they deem any to be um, uh, you know, present in the context of what um, people decide to do um, where abortion is concerned in the United States. So the Supreme Court is actually the last resort court and they actually sit to determine what cases to review. And like I said, Roe v. Wade was a piece of legislation. It's not just the case, it's a huge piece of legislation um, that was there since the, the, you know, the early 1970s that they struck down but they're the ones that will review the very big cases. Now the court has nine justices, and as you know, they are appointed by the president and approved by the US Senate, and they serve for life until except, you know, in cases, you know, whether they're resigned or they removed through an impeachment process. I'm not aware of any high court judge that was impeached anytime recently, but I do know that we've lost, you know, Ruth um, Bader, you know, Gainsbourg, she passed away. And of course, uh, we've had, um, you know, a, a, a judge who paved the way for Kitanji Brown uh, Jackson, who was sworn in last year as uh, the first um, African American, you know, female, um, you know, judge to be appointed. So a lot of firsts are happening in the United States where the Supreme Court is concerned. And of course, we know that she was grilled. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's a lifetime appointment. It is a, it's, it's an appointment that can determine um, shifts of that will occur in the context of the legislations that have been passed years ago. It's really an appointment that can determine what issues are actually tabled and what issues are actually heard and the extent to which hearings will impact our livelihoods in the context of the laws of the land. All right. Now, most cases that will reach the Supreme Court will do so through a petition of what we call certiorari. It's a legal term. You'll hear some more of those legal terms. But typically what the court does is that it, it grants fewer than 5% of the writs for a certiorari that it receives. So in 
a lot of cases you will find that you know it takes years before a case can reach the Supreme Court because of the process before that particular petition it gets to the court. What the court does, it really reviews cases based on written legal briefs and oral arguments by the attorneys for the two sides. So you may find very, very big cases like corporate giant has a case in the Supreme Court, the corporate giant versus the people of the United States. Let's say it's an oil company versus the state of Texas, or it's the president of the United States versus Twitter, or it's you know the president of the United States versus you know some other entity. So it's all about the gravity of the situation, and of course, it has to do with what the court deems as absolutely within the public interest, within the purview of the law, and of course, it really has to do with national development priorities as well in a lot of cases, because it is the court of last resort, and the legislation that will impact people is what they will be looking at um, most closely. Now, if we look at judicial review, very, very early cases dating back to Marbury versus Madison of 1803 gives us an example. And so more than 200 years ago, what the Supreme Court did was granted itself the power to review the constitutionality of laws and of course, government actions. Now, Thomas Jefferson, in this particular course of Marbury, defeated John Adams in the 1800 presidential election. Does this ring a bell? It will very shortly. Before Jefferson took office on the 4th of March in 1801, what Adams and the Congress did was to pass the Judiciary Act of 1801, and that act actually created new courts, added judges, and gave the president more control over the appointment of judges. So this is why you have the situation where the president can appoint judges at the very last minute, or the situation where, you know, you, you can have a, a, what, what they call padding of the Supreme Court. And so what Jefferson did, he defeated Adams in the presidential elections. And of course, before he took office, Adams decided that he was going to make sure he gave himself the power to control the appointment of judges. So what the act did was an attempt by Adams and his party to frustrate Jefferson. And so he used the act to appoint 16 new circuit court judges and 42 new justices of the peace. So the appointments were basically approved by the Senate. And we know that the Senate has to approve appointments. You would have seen, most of you who would have watched the Ketanji Brown Jackson appointment hearings, you know, the Senate Judiciary Committee will hear the appointments by those nominees for the Supreme Court. And there's a lot of grilling taking place about their ethos, about what they believe in, cases that they would have tried in their previous job and stuff like that. And so this, in this particular instance here, the appointees were approved. And of course, they would not be valid until their commissions were delivered by the Secretary of State. So it's the Secretary of State that has to actually give the commission. And this is exactly what was happening if we go back to the January 6th 2021 issue, that was what was happening in terms of them trying to deliver the commission state that, you know what, we are approving the counts and now we are declaring the presidents. So William Marbury, in this case, he was appointed justice of the peace within the District of Columbia, but his commission for that appointment was not delivered. So what he did, he petitioned the Supreme Court to compel the new Secretary of State, James Madison, to deliver the documents. Again, I ask you, does this particular case ring a bell that occurred since way back in the 1800s, all right? So what Marbury did, he joined three others. He was joined by three other similarly situated appointees and they petitioned for a writ of mandamus compelling the delivery of the commissions for the appointment. What the court found was that Madison's refusal to deliver the commission was not just illegal, but they did not order him to actually hand over the Marbury Commission's writ of mandamus. So the court instead actually held that the provision of the Judiciary Act of 1789, a couple of years before this thing happened, enabling Marbury to bring his claim to the Supreme Court was unconstitutional. So what the court is actually saying is that what the president actually did to empower himself was unconstitutional, since, since it really purported to extend the court's original jurisdiction 
beyond which Article 3, Section 2 established within the U.S. Constitution. So the courts, so to speak, students, cannot function outside of what the Constitution says. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the court is actually subject to the Constitution of the United States of America. So what Marshall did, he expanded that a writ of mandamus was the proper way to seek a remedy, but concluded later on that the court could not issue it. He reasoned that the Judiciary Act of 1789 conflicted with the United States Constitution. Therefore, Congress did not have the power to modify the Constitution through regular legislation because the Supremacy Clause places the Constitution before the laws. Again, I'd like to reiterate that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and any interpretation at the level of the Supreme Court has to be subject to what the Constitution says and not subject to what the law has interpreted the Constitution to actually mean. So this is really the preamble to judicial review and some of the issues that have taken place to shift things in the landscape of the legality of the Constitution in the United States. So what Marshall eventually established was the principle of judicial review. That is the power to declare a law unconstitutional in the United States. Now, although all not, you know, not explicitly stated in the Constitution, the court said the power of the judicial review was embedded in the Constitution's balance of power and was an essential means to maintain the rule of law. And of course, do something else, check the abuse of power by the other two branches of government. We know that the executive is one of the branches, the judiciary is the second branch, and of course the legislature is the third branch. So the court was actually saying, we've got to check to make sure that there are no excesses in the use of executive power. And there are no excesses in the use of what happens at the court level, you know, and of course there are no excesses in the use of what happens at the level of the judiciary in terms of what judges are actually passing down um, as it relates to what the constitution actually says. So, so, so for the court, there must be consistency across all three branches of government. And again, I'd like to repeat, the executive, the judiciary and the legislative branches are all subject to the constitution of the United States, all right? So through judicial review, courts have the power to actually interpret constitutions. And of course, to determine when the government actions are really invalid because they fail to meet the constitutional requirements. So no government can ever go against the constitution. And this is the reason why the fiasco occurred on January 6, 2021. Because if the constitution says by the people and for the people, then there's no way that you can actually be in breach of the constitution and hope to win a fair fight when it comes to the ballot, when it comes to what the people require at the level of the votes and stuff like that, all right? So um, there is no way that you can have a reinterpretation and win in a court of law. So state courts really, rarely, it is, it is really not a, a very um, you know, prevalent situation. They will not exercise their power of judicial review. And of course, the US Supreme Court prefers to use this power very sparingly. They don't want to do that because they'll be actually accused of constitutional overreach. All right. Um, there have been a couple of cases where there people have been talking about the powers of the court and the powers of the judiciary in terms of interpreting the constitution and people's rights and human rights. And so that's the reason why they threat very carefully and cautiously when it comes to exercising their power of judicial review. And that's the reason why there are certain decisions that are taken at the level of the state and federal court system because these are the, the places where the interpretation of the constitution, it has to take place before it goes to the Supreme Court. Now, there are a couple of controversies that surround the court's exercise of judicial review, simply because the political appointment of justices, it is going to be subjective. And of course, the argument here is that the justices' political philosophies will actually be inappropriately apply to or influence a court's decision. And so this is the reason why you'll find that there are committees that are there to actually rule, that are there to actually review who are the people who are actually going to represent the interests of the people, for the people. 
when it comes to the political appointments. Now, some judges who are appointed politically may not necessarily be hammered or grilled to the extent uh, of other justices. I recall when, you know, Kitanji Brown Jackson, her review was grueling. I recall Brett Kavanaugh, his particular review was also grueling. So they went into their past lives. They went into allegations. They went into what type of person are you on X or Y issues, um, issues that pertain to LGBTQ rights, issues that pertain to women's rights, and issues that pertain to the Me Too movement. All of those things that were brought to bear, they were consistent with the political ideology of those respective parties that would have appointed the justices or nominated them for appointment. There are still political appointments, but you will find that in a lot of cases, controversy will hover over those appointments as a result of the orientation distinctions across the two political parties, all right? So philosophies will vary and differ, and that's the reason why there's always this fear that if you have a huge red side or red wave of judges, you will find that those particular decisions that are made will be made in favor of the Republicans. Or if there's a blue wave, so to speak, the decisions that will be made or the cases that will be heard will be in favor of the Democrats. In some cases, that is not necessarily so, but this is the fear that has emerged over time. And this is what has caused the controversy surrounding the court's exercise of judicial review. Now, what are the sources of law that we hear about constantly? Where does the law come from? How do we hear issues and cases in terms of what has emerged over time with the law? First, let's talk about constitutional law. So the federal and state constitutional levels, they actually establish government structure, responsibilities, and power. Now, constitutions, like I said, are the highest law in the land. Nobody can contravene the constitution and get away with it scotch-free, as we would normally say. And so federal and state constitutions will establish government structure, responsibility, how somebody can actually function and how they should not function. This is what will happen at a federal and state constitutional level. So federal government, they're subject to scrutiny when it comes to spending. State constitutions as well, they're subject to some level of control when it comes to their meetings, um, to the extent that they can actually have closed door meetings. This is something that is actually sanctioned at the state level in the context of what we call transparency and of course accountability and responsibility and the extent to which they can exercise power over the state. So these are things that are happening really at the highest law of the land and they have to do with constitutional law, all right? Then we have apart from constitutional law, what is called statutory law or black letter law, meaning that it is inscribed, it is the powerful law. And so Congress and the legislatures of every single state, city, and county will make the black letter laws. And of course, they're referred to as statutes. Statutes will govern whatever takes place at the level of the city. Statutes will govern whatever takes place at the level of the county. And so if you're living in a county, you will be governed by the statutes or the laws of that particular county. There are statutes of limitations when it comes to what you can and cannot do. There are statutes and bylaws within the particular state that you're living in, within the county that you're living in, in terms of encumbrance, for instance, noise, in terms of what can and cannot be on the sidewalk, in terms of what particular vehicle of traffic, in terms of what can actually happen in the context of music. So all of these things are done at the county level. There are things that are done at the city level. There are city laws and bylaws in terms of you know, using land and what you can actually use land for and whether you can have a business beyond a certain hour that is open. These are all done at the level of the city or the county. And of course, every state will have their particular laws as well that we refer to as the statutes of the state. Now, in the very olden days, statutes were actually used to be written in a black letter typeface. And that's the reason why they call it the black letter law, because people needed to see what the regulations were to actually um, subscribe to those regulations. All right. That's the reason why it's termed black letter laws. And so they need to make sure that they're fully much aware 
and they're actually adhering to those particular statutes. Now, apart from constitutional law, statutory or black letter law, there is also a third source of law, which is called common law or equity law. Now, courts will determine the meaning of the statutes through the process of what we call statutory construction. And these are actually judge-made laws. You go into a court and the judge is actually passing down those particular laws. They're not compiled into books, but he's creating some sort of equity law when the issue um, has to do with a specific problem. The judge will, will, will actually preside over equity laws in the case of, I would say, some sort of incident between neighbors, all right? Um, if there is need for a, um, you know, a stay, if there is need for someone to have a restraining order or an injunction against someone taking somebody else to court, this is an equity law based on the judgment passed down by the particular presiding judge who will say, I believe that in all fairness to all parties, but in the interest of, I believe that this is what I should pass down based on this specific problem. So by granting an injunction against one party um, in terms of the particular case, case in point being, you know, you want to actually tear down a building, but somebody who is in the community says, if you tear down, tear down that building, it is going to really impact my business because it will encumber. The judge says, well, in all fairness to the business or to the entity or establishment, I'm going to grant an injunction against that particular company so that they cease the demolition exercise in the interest of the other business that is actually bringing the case. So that's where you have equity or what we call common law exercise by the jurisdiction. Um, then common law really has been developed through what we call a body of judicial decisions that rely on precedent and tradition to determine the outcome of this. So perhaps there was some sort of dispute that occurred that reflected a similar precedent or uh, an, an, an issue in another state, and the judge can easily use some sort of, um, you know, legality that was set up to solve that dispute, that precedent to actually say, well, in the case of, you know, Walcott versus the people, a precedent was set near, you know, Walcott said that, you know, if it is that the music is actually played within a certain time, it disturbs rest, then the precedent for that particular case and that happened in, in, in 2013 is that we, um, you know, issued some sort of injunction against the discotheque or the bar to stop music at a certain time. And so that precedent that occurred back in 2014, 2013 is what the judge will use to actually, you know, formalize the dispute or the judgment or the outcome for the case that is arising in 2023. And this is just an example, all right? So it's usually precedent. In some cases, he's going to probably set new precedent, but that, that, ha that rarely happens. It's going to be something that was established before um, in the court system. Now, the rule precedent or stare decisis is a legal doctrine that actually obligates courts to follow historical cases when making a ruling on a similar case. So if I were to go back to the case of noise nuisance, all right, noise nuisance that occurred actually in 2014, and <laughs> Mrs. Smith was not able to sleep because the noise, the noise nuisance occurred between 12 midnight and 4 a.m., when the neighbors wanted to sleep, but there was just this loud, very loud noise nuisance that affected, you know, Mr. Smith. Um, the the particular ruling that happened back in 2014 is likely to be applied in 2023 because that was the rule precedent that the particular court is actually applying, or what we call stare decisis. All right, it will obligate the court who is hearing a similar case today to actually follow the case that occurred in 2014 on that particular ruling. So stare decisis invariably ensures that cases with similar scenarios or facts are approached in the same way. It would be inimical of that particular judge to actually pass down a ruling that says, too bad for you. You need to drink some valium. You need to actually go out of your house and sleep elsewhere. And I'm ruling in favor of the noise nuisance. That is not likely to happen unless there is some complicity at the court system where that particular judgment is concerned. So invariably you'll find that stare decisis or the rule precedent is what is applied 
at the court level. So when you hear of cases and you hear that the ruling has been passed, then it would be very prudent to actually go back and see whether it was based on precedent or whether there was a new ruling. And in some cases, you will find that people are actually appealing when they're not necessarily given the satisfaction because they're saying that in their argument, this is against precedent. How come in 2014, you ruled in favor of whoever, and then now in 2023, it looks as if I am really out in the cold. So check to see exactly how stare decisis is actually applied as a legal doctrine in cases that have had similar nature and similar rulings or the similar rulings, so to speak. Now, we also have what is called administrative law. And this is the authority of administrative agencies um, that they've really established by statute to oversee complex areas that require special expertise. So if you have a situation where you have, you know, um, you know, cases that there is no precedence, this is where administrative law is actually applied to see exactly what is happening with those complex areas that require special counsel in some cases. What is happening right now, special counsel has been applied. All right. That's an example there um, in terms of, you know, documents being found on somebody's property, classified documents. All right. Now, you have thousands of executive branch administrative agencies that are established strictly. Um, you know, they use legal rules to determine everything from the definition of false advertising, and we're crossing over to advertising here now, to the number of different media a given corporation can actually control. And when we get to the module that has to do with the, um, you know, the ethics of advertising, you will see that a lot of times, you know, the interpretation of what constitutes false advertising the burden is actually put on the consumer to be able to say, hey, I think something is actually wrong there because the argument is that we are not passive, but we're active users of services and goods. And so we need to know exactly when something is untruthful when it comes to us. So executive branch administrative agencies really, they have buttressed or they have sort of created a bulwark. They've created a protective hedge around the companies so that you can't necessarily go to a court of law and win a case against an advertising agency if there's a preponderance of evidence of, well, you should have checked. You know, a lot of them indemnify themselves um, against any particular legal you know, action as a result of these particular types of cases that might have come up against them over the years, all right? So <laughs> they can control, you know, you know, in, in some cases, any number, they can control social, uh, they can control traditional as well as new media, but it has to do with the extent to which we're applying the laws when it comes to determining the definition of false advertising. And then we see also that the executives, you know, at, at each level of government, they issue orders that have, the, you know, the force of law. So, you know, the law is always behind the executive. Now, lawsuits in, in, in the case of, of these particular cases are either criminal or civil. And in criminal cases, you will find that the government will bring an action against an individual for violating a criminal statute, all right? And so crimes may be punished by fines and or jail time. And there are some crimes that are, you know, subject to fines if it's not necessarily, um, you know, really um, 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 to the extent of jeopardizing somebody's life or livelihood. Um, you can have a fine if you're in breach of, let's say, um, you know, some, 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 some law or legislation that has to do with speeding, you can get a ticket or a fine, or you can have jail time for, you know, you know driving under the influence and you have hit somebody down, you kill them on the spot. So that is actually jail time. So in the context of how we can actually apply and see the, the government actually bringing an action against an individual for violating a criminal statute. Now, this, is not, this has nothing to do with what I've said previously in terms of the examples of a ticket fine or what is happening in jail time, but you know, something such as perjury or a crime that is deemed to be um, you know, um, treasonous, these can, these can actually lead to jail time. Um, selling state secrets so that can actually lead to jail time. You know, you can be fined for um, actually, you know, not necessarily taking 
know, precaution against, you know, files in your possession that are of national security interest you can be fined for that. It, it's a near miss, but actually jail time if you're found culpable of actually sharing top secret with information. Now, moving down to the civil lawsuit, in a civil lawsuit, you'll find that a private individual or the plaintiff will initiate the process by filing a complaint alleging the defendant caused some harm for which he or she should be held legally responsible. Now, harm can actually extend to, you know, a person losing proceeds as a result of um, some sort of defamation against It is not necessarily a very good product that particular company is selling substandard goods. And if you buy the goods, you will suffer X, Y, and Z. And so they say when you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it to be truthful. And so if you find that, you know, in a civil lawsuit, somebody is saying that as a result of the lies that were repeated across several platforms, I've lost my following. I have lost my credibility. They can actually bring a lawsuit based on the harm as a result of the fallout of the customers, the fallout of the finances, and of course, the mental and emotional anguish that is actually caused. But we will talk about those types of um, particular petitions and law cases later on in the semester. Now, civil suits generally seek monetary damages to compensate the plaintiff, and of course, to penalize the individual responsible who's known as the defendant. In some cases, or in many cases, both criminal and civil suits involve a variety of pretrial processes. And of course, the juries will hear both types of cases. You will read out, you will check to see what the evidence is, you will gather the evidence, of course, you will get the witnesses there, and invariably you have to select jury as well based on the interest. And of course, you're checking to make sure that there is no alignment. And so a lot of these cases that happen they're decided either when a jury reaches a verdict or in the case of a bench trial, the judge issues a judgment. Either outcome may be appealed, they may take it to the appellate court, and of course, judges may, even, may also dismiss cases that do not present a material issue or grant summary judgment when uncontested facts clearly support one side. In other words, if there's a preponderance of evidence supporting the plaintiff, then there is no need for the judge to continue going on um, with the case, the judge will issue the ruling in favor of the plaintiff, vice versa. If there's a preponderance of evidence in favor of the defendant, then the judge issues ruling in favor of the defendant and throws out the plaintiff's case. Now, some legal terminology for us to think about as we wind down for today. Appellate courts are courts of appeal. They have the power to review overrule and amend decisions of trial courts. Now there's the terminology that sometimes we get mixed up with, judge versus judge justice. Judges oversee lower courts or trial courts, and this is a typo, it should be T-R-I-A-L, whereas justices operate at the level of the appellate court, all right? So I'll repeat that. There's a difference between a judge versus a justice. Judges oversee the lower courts and justices operate at the appellate level. The plaintiff is the person or the party who brings a lawsuit against another person. And of course, you may think of the plaintiff as the accuser. And the accused is actually the defendant, the person or the party against whom a lawsuit is filed, right? Party or litigant, this is a term that refers to the plaintiff and or the defendant in a lawsuit. So you will find that you will have legal representation for both party or litigant and the attorneys for the party or litigant are present in the court to make their particular defense on behalf of either the plaintiff or the defendant. And the respondent actually is the party that won before the lower court and is responding to the, to the petition actually in the higher court. Now, fine, finding or bound for a party, as in the court, bound for the plaintiff or defendant, this is a phrase generally used to indicate that the court has sided with the main party. So if you're hearing or you're seeing a story that says the court found in favor of a particular party, the court found or ruled in favor of the plaintiff or the defendant, you will know that that particular phrase indicates who won or whose side the, the actual judgment is in favor of. 
when you hear something like the court upheld or up, you know it's likely to uphold what happened in the appellate court or what happened in the lower court this term has to do with the appeals court agreeing with the ruling of the lower court overruled or reversed this has to do with an indication that the appeals court has disagreed in principle with the ruling of the lower court and has sided with the party that has lost in the lower court and the term attorney or counsel these are different ways in which we refer to the lawyers representing the plaintiff or the defendant and then finally petition i think i've got about two more slides and then we go for today a petition is a document filed by the losing party in the lower court asking for an appellate court to review the actual case I did mention stare decisis, and this is a legal doctrine that obligates courts to follow historical cases when making a ruling on a similar case. And of course, the writ of certiorari, this is the petition filed to the Supreme Court to review a case. And then we have a writ of mandamus, and this is an order from a court to an inferior government official, ordering the government official to properly fulfill their official duties or correct an abuse of discretion, all right? Now, as stated earlier, any court that is decided in the court sets a precedent for future cases dealing with a similar situation. So precedence is that which has gone before and that will be used to actually set the judgment of the current case before the judge. Now, many laws governing the United States come from courts and of course, regarding the abortion, and the right to choose comes from Roe v. Wade, which was struck down. And of course, Brown versus Board of Education, which abolished the segregation of, 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 of people in schools. These are two very landmark cases. And when you think about all the important laws coming from our court system, it becomes apparent as to why it is important to know how to read a particular case. All right. So it's important for you to actually go and learn to do that. And of course, this will follow um, on, um, as I end today's session, some required readings for you, Bethel School District number 403 versus Fraser, Tinker versus Des Moines, and of course, Independent School District. So these are two cases that will actually help to ground what will come in the future and what you've actually heard in today's session. And so I hope that you are, um, you know, better grounded and you understand in a deeper way how the law is made in the United States, and of course, how we came about judicial review at the various segments in society and what is happening right now in our U.S. court system.